Well, you probably expected Coach East up here. He's been doing, I think, a great job introducing everybody. Thank you, Coach East. But now I get to introduce him. Um, I've had a lot of fun this weekend getting to know him. We talked for quite a while last night about the conference and you know suggestions and, and things like that. Um, I'd met him once online before this, and that was it. But uh, like I said, we've had a lot of fun getting to know each other. Uh, Coach East was a Jehovah's Witness for 18 years. And I just found out when I read his bio on the back of his book here that he studied opera for eight years, which is kind of cool. But he also has this book called The Bible Versus the Watchtower. His website is the same thing, thebiblevsthewatchtower.com. And so now, speaking on the subject, the Bible versus the Watchtower, Cochise Pendleton. Amen. <laughs> do, do I get an amen? Amen, <laughs> Okay. Well, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Gosh, where do I begin all these great talks? Thank you, sister. It was a great emotional experience. And you walked through the valley of hell and you came out victorious. Thank you. The Bible versus the Watchtower. I want to read something to you. And I believe that less is more. I'm not going to stand up here and bore you uh, with any my rhetoric or anything else because it's been it's, we've had a lot of spiritual food and the last thing we need to do is get bored I don't want to bore you see I've already had people leaving so, <laughs> so uh, I'll keep it I'll keep it short less is better less is more there was a movie called The Matrix and if everyone remembers Morpheus and Neo and uh, Morpheus offered two pills this is what Morpheus said. Morpheus speaking to Neo says, the matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or, you, or turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. I can still hear him say that. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Neo says, what truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, into a prison that you cannot taste or see or touch. A prison for your mind. I call the watchtower the watchtower matrix because that's exactly what it is. It's, it was Jehovah's Witnesses live in a bubble. They live in a matrix, a bubble, a prison for their mind. Before I begin, I want to thank Charles. I want to thank Julie for, she's always telling me amen. I want to thank Julie and Charles for putting this together. Without them, this wouldn't have happened. This is the Genesis, and we're going to have another one next year. I'm very excited about that. Amen. Here we go. I love it. I love it. I'm the author of this book called The Bible, The Bible Versus the Watchtower. And uh, uh, I was a witness for 18 years. And in this particular book, uh, after leaving the Watchtower, I, um, I drifted for about two years. And uh, uh, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to believe. I didn't want to go into a church. I went into, uh, I grew up as a Mormon uh, at the Mormon Tabernacle in Oakland. That's part of my, my journey in my book that you can read. And uh, when I came out of the watchtower, I immediately wanted to, where is God? I've got to search for God. I joined, I found Christian Science. I was all smiles about it, too, because 
I liked Mary Baker Eddy's material. And uh, I was in it for about a year. And then I realized, well, you know, the, this isn't, this isn't, this ain't it. <laughs> so I left and um, uh, I kept searching. I ended up at Saddleback Church with Pastor Rick Warren, South Orange County. I ended up getting rebaptized there. And that began my journey into the life of serving Jesus Christ and God. And the reason I wrote my book was because I didn't want my fellow brothers and sisters to drift for two years like I had to do. So I wrote my book for the reason that we were brainwashed. We needed to be deprogrammed. And I wrote my book in, 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 the, in a way of like a court case and presented the facts from both sides. And you decide. Because it says here, the Bible verse of the Watchtower, the Jehovah's Witnesses authority, you decide. And I presented it that way. And it is my belief that reading the book, you become deprogrammed immediately. A friend of mine uh, uh, drifted for 20 years. He was afraid to do anything. And uh, it took me a while to get him to read my book. I invited him over to my home. He spent the night. He read my book that night. Before he went to bed the next morning, he said, Coach, geez, I can't believe it. I am. I'm finally free. That's why I wrote my book. The contents of my book, um, the, the highlights, the introduction, the invitation, the Watchtower Authority, round one I called it, uh, the second coming of Christ, round two, prophecy regarding Armageddon, round three, the resurrection, the resurrection prophecy, round four, prophecy regarding the millennial reign of Christ, round five was the stone of God, round six was the generation which has since evolved. And on my website, the Bible versus the Watchtower, again, bsthewatchtower.com, I have articles there that you can, that I print, I, I research and I, as the Watchtower evolves, I evolve with them with an article. And uh, you can go there, print it, it's all free. And that's why, that's why it's there. So any, any evolutionary or metamorphosis the Watchtower wants to put together, I create an article and it's right on my website, so you can go there and, and print them for free. There is the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses at your door. Round seven was the prophet. The watchtower is God's prophet. My spiritual journey. Then the appendix, the Beth Serim deed. The appendix B, uh, watchtower chronology. And example, appendix C, examples for witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's why I wrote my book. You know, uh, Christians, I don't want to offend anybody, but Jehovah's Witnesses know what they believe, but more importantly, they know why they believe it. The problem with the body of Christ is they know what they believe, but they don't know why they believe it. And because of that, as a consequence of that, the cults can knock on their door and convert them. And I blame the body for that. I blame the body for their ignorance and their changing. They're trying to change that. Before I became a Jehovah's Witness, I went to my pastor, who's a Presbyterian. And he um, basically gave me the green light to become a witness. Oh, they're just like any other religion. Any Christian religion is okay. And that was my green light. And that's why I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses, because my pastor told me to. But then I always asked the question when I came out of the watchtower, why did God allow me to walk through the, the, the spiritual darkness of the watchtower? And I came to the conclusion because he wanted me to tell my story. He wanted me to write a book about it and how to deprogram those coming out. So. Any witness that comes out, ask that question. Why did he allow me to walk through that, that uh, valley of darkness? So you can help somebody else. Huh? Okay. 
Let's get back to the matrix. The matrix, according to Morpheus, was a prison for your mind. The question is, who created the matrix? The matrix. The ever-evolving prison for your mind. Pastor Russell. He did it. The Watchtower's teachings today are still Pastor Russell's from yesterday. They haven't changed. The, still, the same tenets, the same doctrine. He did it. So let's, I want to read something from page five of my book. People say, well, you know, you shouldn't attack the Watchtower. I'm not attacking the Watchtower. Why can I say that? Well, let me share with you. The Watchtower, August 15th, 1950, says the Watchtower invites careful and critical examination of its contents in light of the scriptures. I have a, a misprint here. It says Watchtower, January 18th, is actually the golden age or the awake. In, that, in 1933, awake, it says, if the message Jehovah's Witnesses are bringing into the people is true, then it is of great importance to mankind. If it is false, then it is the duty of the clergymen and others who support them to come boldly forward and plainly tell the people where the message is false. Huh? The Watchtower invites us to examine them. So if they ever accuse you of attacking them, share the scripture with them. It's in their magazine. They also said this, which is very, very profound. The May 1st, 1934 Watchtower says this. We should prove by the word of God whether the things found in the Watchtower are from man or from the Lord. Huh? The Bible verses of the Watchtower. Well, let's take one example. The Watchtower, November 15, 1981, on page 21, it says this. It says, come to Jehovah's organization for salvation. In other words, come through their door. Huh? Come to Jehovah's organization for salvation. Well, what does God's word say about that? Remember, it's the Bible versus the watchtower. Huh? Jesus Christ said this in John 10, 7 through 9. In the New World Translation, 2013, their own Bible, this is what it says. So Jesus said to them, again, most truly I say to you, I am the door for the sheep. All those who come in place of me are thieves and plunderers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and that one will go in and out and find pasturage. See, we've already proved the watchtower wrong. They're not the door. Christ is the door. Let me assume for a second, getting back to Pastor Russell, if you needed a heart transplant, would you go to a an eye doctor or a dentist or how about somebody off the street that had no experience had no license to practice had no idea what a scalpel was or even where your heart was would you allow that person to operate on you exactly what about our spiritual health which is far more important than our physical health Using the same rationale and understanding our spiritual health being even more valuable, we must vet our spiritual leaders. And I say vet them even within the church. And the pastor will even affirm that. Not all pastors are Christian. They're wolves. So Pastor Russell, who was he? 
Because remember, he created the matrix. Who was he? We put all our faith in Pastor Russell. The organization put all their faith in him. Well, who was he? What qualifications did he have? You may know this information, but I thought it was pretty profound. He had seven years of schooling. That's all. He's 14 years old. That's all he had. He was not familiar with the Greek language at all. And in a court case, Russell versus Ross, that was, that was affirmed, he admitted. He did not know Greek. He was not confirmed by any clergyman, presbytery, council, or any body of men living. He was not ordained by any bishop. He was not ordained at all. He was an ignorant man. He had no business helping us spiritually. He was not qualified to teach scripture. So who was he? He created the matrix. He was a master of illusion. He was a great speaker. He persuaded people. He was so good at talking and illusions that he got people to believe his rhetoric. What is rhetoric? It is the art of effective persuasiveness. And he was good at it. He could talk. He could talk the skin off a snake. He could sell ice to an Eskimo. He was good. He was good. That's how good he was. And he led us. He led all of us. He created the matrix, a prison for our mind, and we bought it. He said something so profound that I have to read it. It's in the six, uh, six um, volumes of the scripture studies. And uh, Charles brought the last one, the finished mystery that came in through Rutherford. But this is what Pastor Russell, this spiritual leader, this spiritual giant that led us and that we believed in, he says, if the six scripture, the six volumes of scriptures are practically the Bible, he says, he says this in 1910 at, the, uh, uh, at, at a uh, uh, convention, uh, he says, topically arranged with Bible proof texts given, we might not improperly name the volume the Bible in an arranged form. That is to say, they are not mere comments on the Bible, but they are practically the Bible itself. Furthermore, not only do we find that people cannot see, this is still his quote, furthermore, we do not only find that people cannot see the divine plan in studying the Bible by itself, but we see also that if anyone lays the scripture studies aside, even after he has used them, after he has come familiar with them, after he has read them for 10 years, if he then says, if he then lays them aside and ignores them and goes to the Bible alone, though he has understood his Bible for 10 years, our experience shows that within two years he goes into darkness. So, 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 so on, on the hand, if, if he had merely read the scripture studies with their references, his publication, and not read the Bible as such, he would be in the light at the end of two years because he would have the light of the scriptures. That's how arrogant he was. He was an ignoramus. He was an ignorant man, and their leaders have followed suit. He created this illusion, and I call it the Watchtower Matrix for a lack of a better word. Uh, I was asking my wife, does that sound good? And she said, ah, I like that. That sounds good. The, the, there's something that I, that's, most, that's more important than the history of the Watchtower and all their false prophecies and all the dogma that we listen to. There's something that we as the body of Christ must know. We must know how to never be, never allow ourselves to be seduced like that again by any cult. 
If we don't have those tools, so what do we do? What are the tools? How can we never allow ourselves to let that happen again? <clears throat> How to interpret scripture? There are two words that I want you to become familiar with, and I want you to go home, and I want you to study them, and I want you to get reference Bibles, your concordances, and I want you to educate yourself, and it's called exegesis, also hermeneutics. And the pastor here will affirm this. We need to know how to exegize a passage. We need to know how to interpret a passage, whether or not it applies to us today or if it only has application for them. I wrote here, it says, a text, this is very, very important, a text, when you read a text in scripture, whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, a text cannot mean what it could never have meant for its original hearers or readers. It's very, very important. It can never mean something it never meant then. Okay. The true meaning of the biblical text for us is what God originally intended it to mean when it was first spoken or written. Okay. Hermeneutics follows up by, can we apply the text today for us? Sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. But we, we have to know hermeneutics is an art and it's a science. We have to understand how to do it, you see. I took a class in hermeneutics, a couple professor seminary classes, and it's profound. You have to do this. The body of Christ has to do this. Don't ever be deceived again. That's the most important thing that I can say today. We must know how to exegize a passage and we must know how to look at it hermeneutically and interpret it. Is it applicable for me today? Sometimes it is and sometimes it is not, okay? It's very, very, very important. Hermeneutics is therefore the field of study which is concerned with how we interpret the Bible, whereas exegesis is the actual interpretation of the Bible by drawing the meaning out of the biblical text, in other words, Context, context, context. When you read a passage in scripture, it's the context that we need to read to understand. And there are principles. Who is it written to? The historical content. Why was it written? These are questions that we have to ask. How did they interpret it when it was, when it was expounded upon? What did they take it to mean? It's very, that's very, very important. I mean, and the reason why it's important is I don't want to talk too long because I can talk and talk and talk. And um, I was at a party, I was at a party, and a good friend of mine uh, across the street from my home, I'm trying to get him to come to Christ. He's such a wonderful person. None of us are good, but he's a wonderful person. And. Um, uh, there was a, a party of about 10 people, and we were sitting there talking and in and out, the women and the men and stuff. And, and this, this sister that lives across the street, uh, uh, sister in Christ lives across the street, she, uh, my friend and I went to Las Vegas. He wanted to get a tattoo. He's 60. So he gets the yin and yang symbol. And I said, and I said that's funny because if I ever got a tattoo, that's what I would want. Uh, only because I do Tai Chi Chuan, okay, and that's the only symbol that I would want to get. I have no tattoos, but that's the, ironically, that's the only one that I would get if I ever got one. And this is what he wanted, which was kind of blowing my mind. Well, his wife was just so upset. So we went to Vegas, and we got this, he got this tattoo, this yin and yang symbol on the back. So during this meeting, this conversation we're having at this party, this sister... I have to read it to you. I have to read it to you. The sister says, oh, you know, uh, tattoos.
tattoos, uh, they're not Christian. And, uh, you know, the Bible condemns them. And uh, I said, uh, I said, oh, really? He said, oh, oh yes, yes, the Bible, that's what the Bible teaches. And I said, uh, where? where? Oh, it's right. the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. Okay. Well, let me read that. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. Who is the book of Leviticus written for? The nation of? Thank you. Who applied that passage? The nation of Israel. Was it talking to Christians? Huh? No. If this sister knew how to exegize a passage, and if this sister knew anything about hermeneutics, she would have never made an, such an inane comment as that. And my friend is sitting over here, and I only speak up because, hey, hey sister, you know, I was a JW. Oh, I know, I know. Well, what you're doing is you're taking that scripture. Let me just read it for you. Leviticus 19, verse 28. And it's, it says this. It says, you shall not make any cuts on your body, in your body. I have the, uh, the Hebrew Greek key study by, the, uh, by Dr. Zodiades. On your body, in your body. For the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourself. I am the Lord. See, right, is that, see it right there. See, you can't. You, Christians can't have tattoos. And I said, I said, sister, I said, you're... You remind me of the Jehovah's Witnesses. She said, what? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, w w why is that? I said, well, because you're taking that scripture right out of context, just like Jehovah's Witnesses do, and building a doctrine around it, and teaching people today, Christians, they can't have tattoos. Now, whether they want a tattoo or not, you're free in Christ, you go right ahead. Some pastors will, some pastors won't. It depends on the individual. We are all free in Christ. The point being, what is the point? The Israelites were surrounded by pagan cultures. This is why God wrote this. That followed abominable practices up to and including infant sacrifices by fire to one of their gods, Molech, the detestable god of the Amorites. The gods, the people did this to worship their gods, to recognize the dead. That's why they got tattoos and cut their body. It has nothing to do with getting a tattoo. But the sister's teaching that to my friend, and I had to stop her. I said, I'm sorry, sister, but you're dead wrong. And I have to say that it did get heated. And I had to apologize. And I asked her if she knew anything about hermeneutics, and she said, what? You know about Acts of Jesus? He said, what? No, she did not. But I'm not going to stand by and let my friend be, be told what the scripture doesn't teach. Not gonna, it's not going to happen. So it's all good now. I apologize. She apologized because she walked out of the room. She didn't want to hear, hear me speak. I said, well, why are you leaving? We're, I'm trying to explain something. No, no, no. I want and she's a Christian. And the body, see, she's ignorant. So we don't want to be ignorant. Okay. If you, if, you, if you forget everything I say today, don't forget this. Learn how to exegize a passage and learn hermeneutics. It'll make your Bible reading so fascinating. Okay. All right. Now, Pastor Russell, getting back to Pastor Russell, he, he, he seduced people to think that he was the slave in Matthew. In, uh, I, I have to read this. 
Come on, coaches. In Matthew 24, 34, it talks about the generation. And uh, I hate to go by an outline because just it, it messes up my, my rhythm. But sometimes I have to. I'm old. Um, Amen, brother. Oh, I love that. Sister. Thank you so much, man. Amen. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I love you, man. <laughs> Pastor Russell creates this matrix. Don't forget that. It's a matrix. He had no education. He had no spiritual qualifications. He was an ignoramus. But he had one thing that he needed that others didn't have, the art of persuasion. He was a good talker. Like I said, he could talk the skin off a snake. Matthew 24, 34 talks about the generation. This generation will by no means pass away until all things occur. He's the faithful and discreet slave. Matthew 24, 45. Pastor Russell taught that he was a slave and Armageddon was coming, the generation of 1914. If we knew how to exercise a passage, we would have never been seduced. Let me just read something real quick here. In my book on page 46, it says in the, um, the October 8, 1973 wake, it said, and very important for us, it was foretold that such final results would take place within the lifetime of just one generation, the generation that was alive in 1914. And then in the Watchtower, June 1st, 1951, it says on page 335, hence our generation is a generation that will see the start and finish of all these things, including Armageddon. So what's my point? Again, I don't want to regurgitate what you already know, but the point is, as they evolve, if we knew how to exegize a passage, if we knew hermeneutics, we wouldn't have been deceived. Huh? So the 1914 generation, they modified their position you know, it's an evolutionary process. The new position is this. In the 2014 January Watchtower, it says, paragraph 15, in this detailed prophecy about the conclusion of the system of things, remember, this is the matrix. We're in this matrix, and Pastor Russell is teaching this, huh? Even though he's dead, but the evolutionary process continues. The generation but will by no means pass away to all these things happen. We understand that in meaning this generation, Jesus was referring to two groups. Where is that in scripture? The Greek doesn't say that, but they all, uh, uh, understand. We understand, oh you do, who told you that? Two groups of anointed Christians. The first group was on hand in 1914, and they readily discerned the sign of Christ's presence in that year. Those who made up this group were, were, merely were not merely alive in 1914, but they were spirit anointed as sons of God in or before that year. They quote Romans 8. Paragraph 16 says this. The second group included in this generation are anointed contemporaries of the first group. They were not simply alive during the lifetime of those in the first group, but they were anointed with Holy Spirit during the time that those of the first group were still on earth. Thus... Not every anointed person today is included in this generation of whom Jesus spoke. So right there, they're calling Jesus a liar. Today, those in this second group are themselves advanced in years. Yet, Jesus' words at Matthew 24, 34 give us confidence that at least some of this generation will by no means pass away before seeing the start of the Great Tribulation. This should add to our conviction that little time remains before the king of God's kingdom acts to destroy the wicked and usher in a new righteous new world. Now, this is a bunch of hogwash. They change, they change everything because people are dying and they know 
they've got to say something. So that's what they say. If you, if you go to the Cambridge Dictionary and you look up the words contemporary and generation, uh, they cannot reconcile those two words because they mean totally different things. It's like we're ignorant. What? So my point, gosh, I, I, talk. I said less is more. Less is better. In Matthew 24, in Matthew 24, we're going to exegize a passage. We're just going to exegize a couple of scriptures. In Matthew 24, verses 3, it says, He was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the conclusion of the, of the end of the age? In verse 15, there was a, the question is, when and what? Well, the what precedes the when. Jesus Christ told us what was going to happen during this time. Something very important was going to happen. Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, which is Daniel 9, standing in the, the holy place, let the reader use discernment. Something's going to happen before Christ comes. He references Daniel. When you exercise a passage referencing, re referencing Daniel, the scripture in Daniel was speaking was a, was a prayer was being answered. It was referencing the nation of Israel. The application of Daniel has to be applied to the nation of Israel. Jesus referenced it. The whole chapter of Matthew chapter 24, virtually the whole chapter, I think first after verse eight, talks about the tribulation. That generation that sees the beginning of the tribulation period, many, many things will happen. The good news will be, will be preached. The faithful and discreet slave, who, who is that? I don't want to go into detail who that was. It's the body of Christ. It's people who, who believe. The generation are those who are alive at that time. See, now how do I know that? Because scholars tell me that, Dr. Zodiades among other scholars I won't mention, but when you exegize a passage, you get the application, you understand what it means. I could prove anything I want by pulling a scripture out of context. Judas went out and hung himself. Jesus says, go thou and do likewise. When you bring both those together to prove your point, it's called a collapsing context. It doesn't make any sense. But that's what the watchtower does. So don't let it happen again. Learn how to exercise a passage, learn hermeneutics. If we do that, then when we read the Bible, we'll never be duped again. So remember, context, context, context. Who was, the, who was it being written for? What did they understand it to mean? Because it can't mean anything else than, than what it was intended to mean. And then hermeneutics. Can we apply it today? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's all I'm going to say. You know, I, I, I really enjoyed these two days. You've all been <clears throat> so loving, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much.